Command told me it was a training accident, but I'm not so sure. Something weird happened during our final field training exercise. I mean, really weird, not just the usual, did I see what I thought I saw because I've been sleep deprived for 15 weeks. I'm an army combat medic, which means that after completing basic training, I opted to train more so I could become a medical specialist. Combat medic training is four straight months of 16 to 20 hour days, constantly working, learning how to save the lives of my battle buddies and how not to become a casualty myself while I did. I'd made it through to the final, which put me at Joint Base San Antonio for the field training exercise. It's basically the eight day final exam from hell where we go through everything we might be expected to come across while we're on duty. My squad was doing the dismounted patrol, which is exactly what it sounds like. Soldiers walking patrol ready for action. It was hard. It's meant to be hard. But when I was in the middle of it, all I could focus on was making it through. We were walking our route, moving single file through heavy brush. Not a lot of visibility and plenty of things that crunch under your feet while you walk. It was basically a live training simulation. We had weapons but no real ammunition, our full kit, and we had standard combat objectives to accomplish. We all knew that at some point we'd find another patrol. One of the situations we had to deal with was finding casualties, which we'd have to assess, treat, and medevac. It wasn't anything we hadn't been through already. We'd all just been through basic training. We were all stressed beyond belief. But we were soldiers, we were medics, and we were all determined to make it through this together. We'd been walking the patrol route for a while when we found the ambush. Soldiers were lying scattered around a clearing, some in cover and some in the open. Some of them were groaning in pain. Some weren't making any noise. TV medics will rush forward to help the wounded before securing the area. But combat medics aren't that dumb. We deployed to secure the area and that's when the bad guys showed back up. Knowing that the bad guys were actually our own instructors didn't make it feel any less stressful. At that point, I'm pretty sure seeing a fluffy bunny would have sent me into overdrive. Our squad took casualties as we suppressed the threat, which gave us additional patience. We started triage, and we followed the protocol for assessing which patients could be treated first. Soldiers with small cuts weren't the priority. The patient who took a round to the leg and was bleeding from a femoral artery was definitely the main priority. Nothing I've described so far was weird. It was all what we'd been led to understand would be happening. Dismounted patrol, find wounded, care for them, achieve the tactical objective while dealing with casualties. This was where it got strange. My partner and I were working on our patient, who had a simulated gunshot wound to the thoracic cavity. We were working through the march protocol we all knew in our sleep at this point. Massive hemorrhage, airway, respiration, circulation, hypothermia. We were behind some heavy cover while the security detail did their job and kept us clear from bad guys. We were shouting to each other, trying to get our patients to talk to us. Maybe that's why we didn't hear anything. Someone shouted and we all froze. It was a yell like we'd never heard before. I'd heard soldiers who got wounded during basic, I mean, accidents happen, but this sounded different. My partner and I looked at each other as we worked on our patient. I could see the look on his face. We worked on autopilot to stabilize our wounded, but I think we were both wondering the same thing. Was there a second wounded patrol we were supposed to find? When we finished, we filled out the patient's paperwork, tagged it on his belt, and got ready to put him on a litter for evacuation. That's when Staff Sergeant Meadows came running over. He told us to form up and come with him. When your sergeant tells you to do something, you do it. My partner and I handed over our patient and grabbed our rifles and followed him into the brush. We saw the bushes before we saw the body, but Staff Sergeant skidded to a halt and motioned for us to hold while he secured the area. That's when I noticed that his rifle didn't have an orange painted dummy clip. He had live ammunition. At that point, I knew something was wrong, but like I said, I was in combat medic mode and I was following protocol because that is what you do so you come home alive. 
I waited until the staff sergeant waved us forward, and once he did, my battle buddy and I darted forward to the casualty. Actually, seeing someone wounded is beyond stressful. I knew I'd been training for this. I knew this was what I wanted, but it felt so different. This was a real patient with real injuries. We could smell the blood when we rolled the body over. We did everything we were trained to do. Snapped on gloves, did the blood sweep, tried to get the soldier to talk so we'd know if his airway was compromised. I didn't think it was because the claw marks on his face didn't reach the throat. But you still have to check because things can change ridiculously fast, especially in the field. Besides the face, there were defensive wounds on his forearms. The thorax seemed okay, and we didn't need to intubate. I was in this kind of haze where I knew exactly what to do, exactly what to use to help. My partner and I had been working together so much that we moved like one unit. Assess, triage, treat, tourniquet the arm, pack the gashes with hemostatic material. What did this was a question I didn't really ask myself until later. Plenty of stuff had claws out here. Mountain lions. I didn't think there were wolves or bears, but that didn't mean something hadn't wandered through. You don't focus on speculation. But it wasn't speculation making the dry brush on the ground crack. There was something out there. Sergeant's rifle was immediately pointed in the direction of the sound. He motioned for us to finish fast. There was no way a single security point could hold this position safely, even if we were undercover while we worked. Bushes are great for concealing, but bushes won't stop a bullet. We were good. We were fast. We started packing the wounded onto a stretcher, and I finally realized that he was one of our other instructors. What had he been doing out here alone? Sergeant yelled for us to get down and something erupted from the bushes. I say something because I only saw a gray and tan blur before I was on my face in the dirt, covering my patient and clutching my useless rifle. Sergeant screamed. There was a sound like, I don't know, ripping fabric, that sound that a knife makes when it's cutting through a raw steak. There was an incredible smell of blood, too thick to be just from new wounds. It smelled old and there was this awful stink of urine. I couldn't explain the growl. It was low, deep, high up. Whatever this thing was, it wasn't a mountain lion. The dry ground crunched under its weight as it turned, and the growling sounded like it was pointed in our direction. I'm not ashamed to admit I started praying. My battle buddy was doing a little more than that. He'd been fiddling with his two-way radio and set it to make that horrible ultrasonic screech electronics make when you've royally screwed them up. That noise felt like someone took an ice pick to my temple. I can't imagine how that thing felt, but it wasn't good. It yelped and whined. It almost sounded like a dog. And then the stink was gone. My buddy kept the noise going while we scrambled over to Sergeant Meadows. We went into medic mode again, going through the protocol. He had gashes to the chest and had been thrown across the clearing. Very different treatment. We did our best. I won't go through the details of the medevac. Both Sarge and our other patients survived. Our class all passed the simulation, and my battle buddy and I got the highest marks. But nobody, including our two wounded, talked about what happened. The official statement was that cougars had been sighted on base, and that one had attacked an instructor who'd been setting up for our class's dismounted patrol. I know I was functioning on adrenaline and sleep deprivation, but I know whatever we encountered was no cougar. I was working for the Wisconsin DNR when I was sent out to investigate a wild deer with potential chronic wasting disease. It had been reported on the eastern section of the Ice Age Trail. It's a pretty popular trail in the state, so I was told to find the deer quickly and dispatch it if it had any signs of CWD. Three different hikers had reported it over the last week all around the same area. All of the reports said the deer was malnourished, severely injured, and smelled of infection. This description didn't necessarily lead me to believe it was a case of CWD. The more likely cause was an injury that had become gangrene. Either way, 
the deer likely needed to be humanely dispatched. The section of trail the deer was reported on was difficult to access with a vehicle, so I ended up needing to hike in. The deer was reported to be hanging out near one of the public shelters with the last sighting being less than a full day ago. If the deer was in as bad of shape as the witnesses claimed, I'm sure it didn't get far if it was even still alive. I reached the shelter just as a storm began to roll in. It was odd, I didn't see any evidence of rain on the weather forecast that morning, but it looked like it was going to get ugly. I looked around quickly for the deer, but the rain started to fall heavily, and I decided to wait it out in the shelter. The shelters in this area of the park are more like little cabins. They are often used by backpackers through hiking, so it wasn't an unpleasant place to wait out the storm. Just as soon as I took off my backpack and sat down, I was overcome by the stench of rotting flesh. It came out of nowhere and was so strong I was nearly gagging. I looked around the interior of the shelter to see if I could find the source. I thought I saw something move past the doorway, but when I peeked outside, I saw nothing but rain. The stench disappeared as quickly as it had arrived. There was no explanation for it. I tried to eat one of the granola bars I had packed with me, but I just couldn't find my appetite. The rain was pelting the shelter and spraying in through the open doorway. I tried to check the weather forecast on my phone, but I didn't have service. I waited in the shelter for maybe another 30 minutes. The storm hadn't let up, but the stench suddenly returned. I didn't know what was going on, but I knew there was something terribly wrong. I can't explain how I knew, I just knew. I heard something scrape against the side of the shelter. It was loud, even with the rain outside. I looked out through the window, and I saw what looked to be white antlers. That didn't make any sense at all. It was early summer here in Wisconsin. Bucks don't start growing their antlers until much later in the season, and even if, for some reason, they were early, they would be still covered in velvet. I figured this must be the injured deer. It certainly smelled like it was on death's door. I tried to get a better look out the window, but the animal appeared to be moving towards the door of the shelter. Whatever it was, I was about to see it soon enough. I couldn't shake the feeling that there was something off about this whole situation. There was something more to this injured deer. I knew that much, but I didn't know exactly what it was. I brought the gun I would use to dispatch this deer. I pointed it at the door and waited. The doorway was dark with storm outside, but I could see well enough to know that the creature that walked into view wasn't just some old, injured deer. It was about twice the size of a whitetail. Its body was absolutely skeletal. I could have counted its ribs even without the rain soaking the beast. Its fur was long and stringy, like the kind of long hair you'd find on a dog. Parts of it were missing fur completely. But that's not the worst part. Its head was a skull. No hair, no skin, just bone with the antlers attached. I didn't see any eyes in its sockets, but like I said, it was dark. I could see it had a tongue in its jaw, and its teeth looked like those of a deer. The lower jaw didn't appear to be hanging on by much. I don't know what the thing was. I gave it about ten seconds standing there in that dark, rain-soaked doorway before I fired at it. I hit that beast three times center mass and it ran away. Literally ran away like it had been scared or something. Not like it had just been blasted with a shotgun. It didn't fall down. It didn't even falter a step. It just ran. I waited another hour for the storm to pass before hiking out of there. I had never been so scared in my life. If a shotgun couldn't stop it, there was nothing I could do if I ran into it again. I can't tell you how relieved I was when I finally reached my truck. I had no idea what to report to my boss. I told him there was something terribly wrong with the deer and it was something I had never seen before. And that I shot it three times and it acted like it was nothing. No one believed me. I ended up leaving that position in six months for a desk job and I never, never, ever go hiking alone anymore. When I was in the Army, I spent a couple of years working at a military hospital. I had always intended on going into medicine, but at the time I only took the training for patient administration. 
Things were typically pretty low-key around there, and much of the time it just felt like an office job. I was stationed in San Antonio and was assigned to mostly work under one particular surgeon. There were times when I had to stay after hours to catch up on paperwork. There were even a few times I went in really late at night to catch up on things. I had a real insomnia problem at the time. I will admit, though, that it did feel creepy to be at the hospital late at night. Mainly the side of the hospital I was on, with the offices, was especially quiet. There would be an occasional nurse or security guard come through, but that was few and far between. On the night this happened, I had gone over around midnight. It was in November, and it was cold and snowy. When I got to the hospital, I walked to the office area, but entered through the back door that's reserved for staff. The front receptionist door was locked since the offices were closed. I went in and walked to my desk, which incidentally was all the way by the front receptionist door, but like I said, that door was locked. Everything seemed normal, kind of creepy, but that was usual for that time of night. And so, like every other time I was there late, I turned on a podcast and got to work. Notably though, since no one was there, I wasn't using headphones. After about an hour in, I thought I heard footsteps mixed in with my podcast. I paused it to see if it was a part of the recording or if they were in the building with me, and sure enough, I still heard the footsteps. My first thought was that it was a security guard. They didn't usually come into the office area, but there are glass doors in the front, and they could have seen my light on and were coming to check it out. So I yelled out, Hello? There was no answer, but the footsteps didn't stop, so started to walk over to check things out. I was thinking maybe they didn't hear me. I walked toward the common area in the office. The lights were off since I had never turned them on. I only turned on the light by the back staff door and the light by my desk. The switches were right beside me, so I flicked them all on. There was no one there, but when I turned on the light, very noticeably, the footsteps stopped. I was starting to feel freaked out at this point, and the only thing that made my head not hurt was thinking that maybe one of the doctors had forgotten something. So, leaving the light on, I went and looked around. I didn't see anyone at all. I assumed that I'd been imagining things. So, I eventually turned the lights off and went back to work. It wasn't even five minutes later when I heard the footsteps again. At this point, curiosity and adrenaline made me want to find out exactly what was going on. I also started to have the thought that it could be someone up to no good and I should intervene. So I went back out to the common area, but this time I was really quiet and didn't turn the lights on. I walked toward the direction of the footsteps, and as I approached, they stopped. I stood still for a moment, and then I heard the footsteps again, this time back by the office where I had just been working. So I walked there as silently as I could. The same thing happened. The footsteps stopped as I approached. I called out in a normal voice, but it sounded like I was yelling since it was dead quiet. Is there someone there? What's going on? At that point, the door to the surgeon's office, which was right behind me, slammed open and closed. Now that's strange enough to be horrifying, but especially so because that door was always locked. I immediately started to feel an overwhelming sense of doom. Right then, the temperature in the room dropped drastically. And at the same time, out of my peripheral vision, I saw a figure flash by with the sound of running footsteps. The sound passed right next to me, and I caught a smell of something like gunpowder, and then the sound and the smell became fainter and fainter. I was petrified. I had been there countless times at night and had never encountered anything like this. I made myself go over and look in the office of the surgeon. The door was unlocked, even though it had checked out as locked twice before. When I turned on the light, I saw glass shattered on the floor by the desk. It was a framed picture of the surgeon's family. Nothing else in the room looked to be disturbed. I instantly turned around and left the building. When I went outside, it was still snowing, and yet there was no sign of footprints leaving the building. I couldn't drive away fast enough. That ice-cold fear I had felt was indescribable. I never even said anything about it to anyone. After that, I did stay late at the hospital a few times, but only if I wasn't alone.
I don't know exactly what I saw. It's all just one big blur. And the more I think about it, the more questions I end up with. It was a cold winter night. The ground had a decent amount of snow on it. At the time, I was one of those park cops, only I had a small vehicle. We don't ride horses. I patrolled a wooded area near the east coast. A lot of times, the worst we would come across were some teens smooching and things like that. That was usually our eventful night, busting kids for being too promiscuous. But the snow was out. And when the snow is out, teens aren't as interested in going out. But I was doing my nightly due diligence, checking to make sure the park was running properly and that no one was lighting things on fire, stuff like that. Sometimes the homeless set up a small spot where they can sit around a fire. I wish I could allow it. They deserve warmth, too, but we can't have anyone accidentally burning down trees or anything, so that's where I have to get involved. My first responsibility is human safety. After that, it's plant safety. That's what I like to think. Anyway, the snow wasn't falling anymore when this happened. It had stopped, and the snow on the ground was starting to freeze down. It was a bit tough to move through, though, since the plows hadn't gone through the main roads yet. That meant the small roads weren't cleaned up either. It was just frigid. And I have to admit, I was getting a little car sick from the bumpy ride. We aren't allowed to smoke in the park area, so I have this weird area down by a waste management facility where I would go for a break. We have access to some of the dumpsters outside their enclosure. And the road and little area that they are on isn't really owned by anyone. Sometimes we find squatters hanging out there, but that night it was empty. I was just taking my smoke break, catching my balance. You know, just taking it easy. It was weird how silent it was, like it was so quiet. It was nice, I liked it, but it was also kind of creepy. Anyways, I was smoking my cigarette and rubbing my hands together to try and get the blood moving when I heard some movement in the shrubs off to the side of me. It wasn't unusual, but it wigged me out a little because it had been so quiet. So I'm watching this bush. It wiggles a bit, but then it stops. It could have been a chipmunk or something. No biggie. I finished my cigarette, put it out and threw it in the dumpster bin and got back into my vehicle. I start circling the area again. Eventually, I come along that part of the road again, but a little further up towards some trees. This area is dimly lit. Like I said, sometimes squatters come and use the area. It's a great place to hide out if that's what you're trying to do. But then I notice something very small and close to the ground. I didn't spot it at first. The snow was very white and this thing was very pale too. At first I thought it might have been a plastic bag moving in the wind. But then I realized how round the thing was. It looks like a ball that you might play with in gym class. Just a plain weird ball, kind of like a tether ball. It was weird because those balls are pretty hefty, but it was moving around. The wind couldn't be moving it. So I start to wonder if maybe someone is moving the ball around and they are sitting underneath this tree. But that's when the thing moved more. Like the ball grew a torso and arms, and it kind of propped itself up. Now it no longer looked like a ball. It looked like a large round head on a tiny, frail body. It was creepy as all. But I thought maybe it could be a kid, a baby, left out in the snow. So I stopped my car and I got out. I moved slowly towards the tree. And when I went to look at the kid, it wasn't there. It disappeared. But the weird thing was, the spot where it had been standing in the snow had been disturbed. So something was sitting in that spot, but it was gone. And the other weird thing was that there weren't any footsteps left. I couldn't have followed its trail. So it really just poof into thin air. I walked around for some time and I radioed my supervisor. I started a whole search team for an endangered kid. I really thought someone was endangered, but we never found them. And after that, I kind of lost a bit of my credibility. I was honest, though. I told them I saw a weird, possibly malnourished, small child in the snow. And when I went to help the child, it disappeared. I guess I could see why no one would believe me. But I didn't think I'd be labeled as crazy. I had been a good deputy.
I had always had the best intentions of the park and everyone in it. And I know I'm not crazy. I saw something that night. I'm not really sure what I saw. But I know it was something that, to me, looked like it needed help. And I'll help anybody. It was freaky looking. But it looked cold and kind of sick, you know. I still worry about it. What if it was a kid and now it's gone because I didn't save it? That crosses my mind from time to time. But I remind myself that I did what I could. I searched for it. My intention was good. This is something I've witnessed myself in New Mexico. For a while I thought I might be insane or hallucinating, but now I know I'm not. I own a decent-sized ranch in the northwestern part of the state. I have a few hundred head of cattle and twice as many chickens. I'm one of the last true ranchers left in the area. I inherited the property from my father and he inherited it from his, going all the way back to the early 1900s before New Mexico was even a state. Even way back then, there were stories of monsters and demons living in the desert. Everybody's heard of the chupacabra, but I never paid any of it any mind, thinking it was all a bunch of horse crap. Well, my opinion has changed. You see, about a month ago, some pretty nasty things started happening out in the area. A man that I was good friends with discovered three of his dogs torn to shreds at the edge of his property. Those dogs were tough mixed breeds. He used to take them elk hunting up north. Whatever killed those poor pups sure wasn't a coyote. I kept my own dog, Cruiser, close by my side after that. A few nights later, we had our own incident. It was late in the evening. The sun had just gone down. I was in Albuquerque all day and had gotten back late, but I still had a few things to take care of before going to sleep when I heard a commotion coming from the hen house. Sometimes a coyote came sniffing around and occasionally managed to finagle its way into the hen house, usually at the loss of one or two hens. But as I ran up to the building, I could hear an extreme disturbance coming from inside and the sounds of hundreds of chickens going berserk. As I threw open the door, I could tell something was seriously wrong. Every hen in the building, about 400 of them, were in an extreme state of panic. I heard the sound of wrenching metal coming from the far side of the building and ran to investigate. I was greeted with a scene of chaos. A huge gaping hole had been torn into the side of the house, like something sharp had just sheared through sheet metal, creating a ten-foot wide gap. Dozens of hens had been torn to pieces. Chicken wire, wood, and feathers were all there in a bloody, twisted mess. Raising and slaughtering animals for food is a part of what I do, and agree or disagree, it is a vital component of this country's way of life. But even my heart broke a little at the way these poor little girls had perished, wasteful and needless. Whatever had perpetrated this had done so for the pure sake of taking lives. We fixed up the damage as best we could, and I asked a few of my hands to stay in our guest house for a few days until whatever this was blew over. I wish that had been the end of it, but there was to be one last incident. A few nights afterwards, sometime in the middle of the night, I was woken by my wife shaking me violently. She said that Cruiser, who was sleeping at the foot of the bed, had jumped up snarling and took off out of the room and down the stairs. We had a doggy door for Cruiser, he was used to being his own dog, and he was outside right now barking up a storm at something out there in the darkness. Cruiser was a clever dog and well-trained. If he was alarmed, then it was for a good reason. More importantly, he was my closest and most loyal companion of these last 12 years, and I'd be damned if he was going to face whatever was out there alone. Hardly stopping to think, I grabbed my 12-gauge from beside my bed and, like a fool, ran out into the New Mexico night with no shoes, no light, and no idea what I was going up against. Before I had made it outside, Cruiser's barking had stopped short. I ran out onto the front porch and couldn't see him anywhere. The immediate area was illuminated by lights from the house, but beyond that was complete darkness. I ran to the perimeter of the light, yelling Cruiser repeatedly in a near state of panic. 
Suddenly I heard his barking again, this time way out in the darkness. I took off, heading straight for the barking, gravel and stones cutting into the bare skin of my feet. When I got to the spot where I had thought I heard Cruiser, I heard his barking again, coming from a different direction. I ran towards it, but before I could reach him again, the noise changed directions. Another two or three times this happened, each time taking me further and further from the fading lights of the house. I sat panting in the darkness. I knew that something was very wrong. Cruiser hadn't barked in several minutes, and I wasn't completely sure which direction led back to the house. As I was trying to catch my breath and consider my options, I heard something slinking around just outside my field of vision. Then, the absolute most terrifying moment of my entire life occurred. From right behind me, not ten feet away, came a human scream. It was my voice, me, screaming Cruiser, exactly as I had been doing for the last ten minutes. I turned, raising my shotgun to fire. In the instant before pulling the trigger, I could make out a black shape at least ten feet high. The area around is seemed brighter in comparison, as if it pulled the darkness into itself. I fired, and in the brief muzzle flash, I saw something shooting straight for my head. I felt an impact, and then nothing at all. One of my field hands found me, laying out there in the dark, about a quarter mile away from the house. It was a feat of luck that he did, for even a group of six men could have easily passed me by in the dark. I was still out of it, and they carried me back to the house and laid me down. The next day I woke up to a bad gash on my head, and even worse news. My man who had found me told me that my wife had called them when I ran out into the night. When they came looking for me, they heard my shotgun blast and followed the noise. He said there was nothing in the area where they found me, except a pool of thick black liquid leading to a spatter trail going off into the desert. They also found Cruiser huddled under a bush, not too far away from my house, completely on the opposite side of where I had been looking. They could barely get him out from under there, and he's still not 100% relaxed again yet. By the grace of God, nothing else has happened since, though. It's only been two weeks. I've asked two of my hands to move onto the property permanently and contracted a security company to install a dozen-plus security cameras around the ranch. I can confirm that there is something deadly out in the New Mexican desert. Call it a chupacabra or a demon or whatever. I don't care. All I know is that it's not just an animal hunting for food, it's evil. It toys with its prey and kills for sport. Just be careful out there. I was a county sheriff for a small town in Ohio when this happened. In total, I was there for a couple of years before finding another position closer to my parents' house. They were getting older and I wanted to be closer to home. At least that's what I told everyone when I moved away. The reality of it was, I was moving because of an experience I had on the job in May of 2008. I was called to a home regarding a complaint about some neighborhood kids. I didn't know the details, but I wasn't worried. This type of thing happens all the time, especially in smaller towns where kids don't have that much to do. Sometimes there is property damage that we need to report, but for the most part, it's just harmless pranks. I had a name, an address, and a message about crazy, evil demon children, but that was it. A woman answered the door when I arrived at the house. I would guess her to be in her mid-sixties. She was a nice lady, seemed normal enough at our first interaction, but she was terrified to go outside. She asked me to remove my sunglasses before she let me through the door. I didn't understand why until later. She told me three kids came to her door last night, all dressed up in old clothes like they were Amish or something. She said they pounded on her front door and claimed they needed help. Their story was that they were lost and needed to use her phone. Of course, she opened the door, but the kids all just stood there with their eyes down, staring at their feet. They repeated their plea that they were lost and needed to use the phone. She asked the kids where they were from, but they wouldn't say. They just kept repeating that they were lost and needed the phone. And then they asked if they could come in. 
The woman told me it was then that she knew something was wrong. She didn't say how she knew, but she knew she couldn't let them in. She said she offered to bring her phone out to the porch for them to use, but then they said they were cold, and could they please come inside? The woman said no, and when she went to close the door, all three kids looked up at her. She claimed that it was at that point that she realized they all had black eyes. Not just black irises, but the whole eye was completely black. She slammed her front door and locked it, but she said as soon as she turned the lock on the door, there was instantly pounding on the back door. She looked across the house, and there were the kids knocking at the back door. She said there was no way they could have gotten there so fast, when just a moment ago, they were all at the front of the house. She ran to the back door and locked it before they could get in. She then went around to every window in the house, locking them and pulling the shades. She then said that she ended up locking herself in her bedroom all night. She said there was periodic knocking at her doors and windows all throughout the night, but she was too terrified to get up and look. I took her story down exactly as she told it, regardless of how ridiculous it sounded. She was convinced the kids were some evil creatures from hell, but I reassured her that it was most likely a very elaborate prank. It wouldn't be too hard for a few kids to go to a costume shop and pick up some outfits and black contacts for a prank night. I advised her to look into getting a home security system and some cameras so she could have some peace of mind in her home. There wasn't much else I could do. I didn't think much about the creepy kids until later that night when I stopped at a gas station to pick up a bottle of water and a couple of snacks. The gas station was pretty quiet, but that wasn't unusual for that part of town. As I got back to my car and closed the door, there was a knock at my window. It was a child, maybe nine or ten years old at the most, dressed in what looked like old Victorian-era clothes. I thought, great, I've got a lead on these pranksters. But when I rolled down my window, I felt an overwhelming sense of dread. The kid said he was lost and asked if he could get in my car. My heart jumped into my throat as if my body sensed something evil. I didn't know what this thing was this so-called child, but I knew it wasn't human. I asked the kid for his name and where he lived, but he just kept repeating that he was lost and asking to come into the car. It was almost like he didn't know how to say anything else. I told him he couldn't come in, but I could call his parents for him. Then the kid looked up at me with eyes black as night, and without changing the look on his face, he turned and took off into the forest on the other side of the road. Once he reached the trees, he seemingly disappeared into thin air. I didn't try to follow him. I just knew that wouldn't end well, and I didn't want to find out exactly what that would be. Like a lot of people who work as park rangers, I love the outdoors. I don't want to be under a roof. I want to be out hiking, trail clearing, whatever. I work at Henry W. Coast State Park, an 87,000 acre reserve in Northern California. It's a big place full of relatively unspoiled wilderness and gorgeous scenery. We have fishing, hunting, and even equestrian campgrounds if you want to bring your horse. The park is what you'd call rugged. In fact, some of the more adventurous hiking loops are steep enough that you need to be in great shape to make it all the way through. Naturally, maintaining the trails is important and checking trail conditions can take a long time. Typically, we do our routine patrols alone, but there are times and places where we go in pairs. Since I've been on the job for a while, I usually have one of the more junior park rangers with me. It's nice because I like showing them some of the spots only a longtime ranger knows. We don't talk about it much, but there are a few places in Henry Co. Park that, well, they have a history. Actually, a lot of the park has a history, but it's not generally known, but this one is... The park staff calls it Hangman's Hill. It's not just a scenic overlook with an interesting name. That title was earned because the tree at the top was used to execute more than one outlaw during California's Wild West days. Since Hangman's Hill is a popular hiking destination, the trail and area see more use than most. We regularly patrol and check the trail conditions to make sure they're as safe as possible. I was out on patrol with Oliver, one of the newest park rangers. We were hiking the long loop up to Hangman's Hill. 
It starts out easy, but the middle section gets steep and rough, and even the best hikers need to take breaks. We did a little trail maintenance along the way, picking up trash and cleaning up. It always amazes me that people can't leave the wilderness the way they found it. There were a few places where there were deeper ruts in the dirt, like something had been digging in the trail, but we filled those in. The day was perfect for hiking, clear blue sky, annoyingly bright sunshine, and the weather was a crisp 73 degrees. Oliver and I made good time as we progressed up the trail. We passed a few hikers, but apparently Hangman's Hill wasn't popular that day. That was fine by me. We'd been getting some complaints about downed tree limbs up there, and the last thing I wanted to do was deal with the public while I was trying to hack up a giant branch. At the halfway point, when the trail gets steep enough that you're climbing rather than hiking, we took a breather, and I casually asked Oliver whether he'd been up this trail before. He hadn't. This is always the awkward part of breaking in a new park ranger, because it can go one of two ways. I can warn them nothing happens, and they think I'm being a jerk and complain to our supervisor, or they don't believe me, and if something does happen, I have to deal with a terrified co-worker who complains to our supervisor. I asked Oliver if he's been up to Hangman's Hill before. He hasn't. Hasn't even heard of it. Well, this is going to be fun. I casually mention that the site has a lot of history behind it. Desperados, horse rustlers, claim jumpers, and classic Wild West justice. There was even an infamous pair of brothers who were hanged up there. I don't lay it on too thick, I just tell it like a historical lecture, and I can tell Oliver is taking it like classroom information. I don't think that'll last long, but I guess it depends on the hill. The hike up to the crest of Hangman's Hill is another hour, and the minute we get up to the site, I can tell it's going to be a rough visit. The bright sun that's been making me squint, even though I'm wearing sunglasses and my uniform hat is strangely cool and dim. There's a breeze moving through the pines at the perimeter of the hill. The perimeter, not the hilltop itself. The hanging tree is the only thing at the top, and it stands at the center of the hill. Nothing but grass grows around it. No flowers, no scrub. Just weedy grass that's too tough to care about what else is up there. The tree itself is completely bare. Bark beetles got to it decades ago, and a burned-out hollow at the base shows that it's been struck by lightning at least once. Most of the tree limbs are long gone, except one. The one branch that still exists is thick and juts out far to the right. It's about 12 feet off the ground. Perfect height for the hangman's noose. Going up to hangman's hill is never a good time, but there's a job to do. I point out the dead fall and broken branches from the last windstorm, and Oliver and I get to work. I give him credit for keeping his cool, but I also wonder how long it will take before he notices that, aside from the strangely loud sound of our saws, there's no sound at the top of the hill. No birds singing, nothing. The fact that I can feel a breeze but not hear it, it's bad sign number two. We finish cutting the deadfall into manageable logs and stack them off to the side, and that's when Oliver really looks at the hanging tree. He asks me why we don't cut that one down. It's dead. I'm all set to give him the it's a historical marker talk when the wind shifts, blowing right past the tree. I smell the unmistakable stink of rot and decay, even though there isn't anything dead that I can see. All of a sudden, I feel a blast of wind rush up the hilltop, and there's sound again. Men swearing, the deep grunts and neighing of horses. The crack of a gunshot bounces all around us, and both of us hit the ground out of reflex. Oliver's looking around for the shooter. I'm looking at the tree. There's something on it. Or, well, two somethings. Two black ragged shapes. Heads tilted at unnatural angles, twisting in the wind as they dangle from thick black ropes slung over that single long branch. The wind shifts to bring the stink of whiskey and body odor right into our faces. There's a huge, horrible feeling of pressure, like we're in the eye of a storm, and the sunlight goes so pale it might as well not be there. I manage to tell Oliver that we're done. Time to head out. I dig into my pack for the emergency bottle of whiskey I carry when I have to come up here and roll it toward the hanging tree. Oliver and I slide back over the edge of the hill and scramble down the slope. We haven't talked for a long time. 
When we got back to the ranger station, I opened my desk drawer for another bottle of whiskey and I offered him some. He shakes his head. When I came in the next day, I heard that Oliver put in for a transfer to another park. Me? Well, I'm still here. After all, somebody's got to keep Hangman's Hill's ghost supplied with whiskey. When I joined the Air Force, I was given the opportunity to train as a mechanic. I enjoyed working on aircraft, but as with most jobs, there were secondary duties which weren't the most fun. For us, one of those chores was looking after the tool supplies. Usually we had a permanent civilian who ran tool supplies during the day, but someone had to be in there to run it during the night shift. The tool supplies building was in the middle of the airfield and pretty far away from the other hangars. It was at enough of a distance to feel pretty isolated. As a new enlistee, I was told that the tool supplies building on our squadron was haunted. I thought it was the usual crap that people would tell the new person, so I discounted it. I had done my fair share of tool duty when I was brand new. You don't really have much value until you're trained up, so they put you in the supply division. I had never had any issues, though. But about six months into my posting at this particular squadron, I found myself there again. We were night flying on the evening in question. That meant hardly anybody needed tools, so it definitely wasn't busy. I hadn't seen anyone in over an hour. It was getting on to about midnight and usually we were trying to lock up by 1.30. But when we were night flying, the aircraft didn't land until around midnight, so we had to stay open longer in case they returned with something in disrepair. I was really tired and trying to keep my eyes open when I started hearing the sound of metal creaking. It was an old building with a ground floor and a first floor. The first floor was basically just metal staging, and you could see down to the ground from the first floor over a balcony-like structure. Although there were two floors, you could see pretty well upstairs from the ground and vice versa. The sound of metal creaking wasn't that unusual. The temperature was dropping, so it wasn't anything out of the ordinary but not seeing or talking to anyone for a while just seemed to make it a lot more noticeable. Half an hour passed and I heard what sounded like metal dropping onto metal. There were lots of metal shelves, however the floor was rubber studded. Anything that dropped off the shelf wouldn't have made much noise unless it was big, in which case there would be a dull thud. This was a distinct metal on metal sound. It was annoying me because I was in the office watching TV, and it was clearly audible above that, so it wasn't quiet. I decided to take a walk around and make sure nothing had fallen. Tool control was quite important, and if any tools were missing at the end of the night, everything would grind to a halt, and we'd have to search high and low until it was found. Nobody would be going home if we lost something. I decided it would be better to find something on the floor now than to wait until later and realize something wasn't where it should be. I walked around slowly, checking every tool, making sure everything that wasn't there was tagged out correctly or had paperwork stating where it was. I saw nothing out of place. I had a look upstairs, although I knew the noise hadn't come from up there. But nothing seemed to be out of place. At that point I found myself slightly on edge. The thought had played on my mind that it might have been some of the other guys winding me up. Usually we told the tool supplies ghost story to new people, and then when they found themselves on duty, it was fun to mess with them and silently come in through a little hatch in the back of the building. New people didn't know it was there, so you could get in undetected and get them spooked. I had been in the squadron for a while, and by this point, I was often the one playing the jokes. It didn't make much sense for anyone to be playing tricks on me. I took a seat back in the office and continued watching crappy midnight TV, just praying the jets would all come down in good shape so I could get out of there. No more than five minutes later, I started hearing footsteps. Finally, someone actually needs something, I thought. I went out to see what they wanted, but no one was there. I checked outside the front door in case they were bringing something back and needed help unloading it from the van, but there was nobody there. I thought I was losing it by then. I was really tired. I turned around to head back inside and I saw wet footprints on the floor. It was wet outside, but my boots were dry since I hadn't been out all night. 
Nobody was in the tool supply area when I walked to the door, and nobody could have gotten past me to get inside while I was looking outside. While I stood there looking around, the footsteps started up again, and a whole shelf's worth of tools came clattering to the ground, as if an invisible hand had just swept across and pushed them over the edge. There was literally zero explanation for something like that happening. No wind, no earthquake, no movement of any sort. I just stood there, staring at the pile, and I felt ice cold. I had never before believed in things being haunted or any kind of paranormal activity, but if something was trying to convince me that I should be, they sure did a good job. It doesn't seem like a huge thing, but it really freaked me out. After that night, I always did whatever I could to get myself out of that duty. I'm a retired sheriff. This incident happened quite a while ago, but it's the only thing in all my years on the job that I could never explain. I was working for a district in rural Illinois. There wasn't much that went on in that county, and we all liked it that way. Occasionally, I'd have to deal with domestic disturbances or property damage, but it wasn't anything like working in a big city. Of course, we'd get calls about teenagers disturbing the peace, usually on the weekends. One of the downsides of being in a rural setting is that there's not much to do. So, kids tend to go around and cause trouble. Normally, it isn't much of an issue, and just me showing up in the squad car is enough to scare them straight. This particular incident happened on a Friday night. There is a section of densely wooded hiking trails open to the public at the edge of town. There's about 14 miles of trails in total. The trails aren't very well maintained and go pretty deep into the woods. There's a creek that flows through the woods. It used to be a proper river years ago, but it's dried up for whatever reason. I'm not a conservation officer, so I couldn't tell you why. Back in the late 1800s, there used to be a mill on the river, and its remnants still stand there today. These days, the old mill has become a hangout for local teenagers to drink and party. Last time I was out there, it was full of empty cans, bottles, and graffiti. The kids think they are far enough into the forest to avoid getting caught, but the problem is that there are several homes that surround this plot of woods, and the people who live there can hear the kids partying. I got a noise complaint from one of the neighbors claiming that they heard kids screaming and saw flashing lights in the forest near the old mill. This definitely wasn't my first time busting teenagers at the mill, so I headed out without a second thought. The hike to reach the mill was about three miles. Not exactly how I wanted to spend my Friday night, but I suppose it all pays the same. There weren't any cars parked in the public lot when I arrived, but that didn't necessarily mean anything. Teenagers up to no good are smart. They probably parked elsewhere and walked in. I headed into the woods with my flashlight. I could hear the kids laughing and yelling just about as soon as I set for on the trail. They didn't sound too far away, certainly not far enough to be at the mill. My first thought was, I was glad I wasn't going to have to hike all the way to the mill tonight. At first it sounded like the voices were coming from somewhere left of my location, but as I tried to follow them, they moved to my right. I called out and told them to stop screwing around, but I didn't get an answer. I knew they most likely saw me and were heading out of there as fast as they could. I decided to head to the mill anyway, since that was where the neighbor claimed the lights were coming from, and quite possibly, there would still be something going on there. The forest got quiet for the rest of my walk to the mill. The trail was severely overgrown, but I managed to follow it even in the dark. I heard the creak and knew I was close. And that's when I heard the voices again. Same as last time, it was just screaming and laughing. I couldn't make out any words. I shined my flashlight towards the mill, but I didn't see anyone there. They were somewhere in the forest, but I couldn't pinpoint exactly where. The voices somehow both sounded far away and very close at the same time. They seemed to come from all directions. I shined my light into the woods and caught multiple lights reflecting back at me. My first thought was flashlights, but as I looked closer, they were eyes. There must have been at least 12 sets of eyes, all standing about my height. 
They stayed hidden in the shadows, so I couldn't get a good look at what their faces looked like, but I saw they had ghostly white skin. Their voices sounded human, even though they didn't speak any words, but I knew when I saw their eyes that they were something else entirely. I slowly backed away down the trail. I didn't want to run in case it triggered these things to chase me. I did shine my light once again at the mill. I don't know why I did it. I wasn't thinking rationally at that point. But the dilapidated old building lit up entirely with eyes. I didn't stick around to count them, but there must have been at least another ten of them in there. The voices followed me all the way back to my car. It was the most terrifying thing I had ever experienced. They were coming from all directions. Some close, some far away. It was like they were trying to lure me off the trail or get me lost. Now, I'm not religious, but I was praying to all the gods to get me out of there and safely back to my car that night. Miraculously, I managed to follow the trail out. I was pretty shaken up by the time I got back to the car. I went back to the station and locked myself inside for the rest of my shift. I didn't know what to write in the report. I never talked to the person who left the complaint about the teenagers that night. It was just a message on the answering machine at the station. I tried to call the number, but it was disconnected. I did some digging on the phone number, and it didn't belong to anyone in our county. I then pulled the phone records from the station and matched every incoming call from that day and the day before, and it just didn't exist. I couldn't explain any of it. I decided to make a report of a dangerous black bear in the woods, and we put up barricades to keep people out of there. I don't know what those things were, but I knew they weren't anything good, and I had to keep people away from them. My parents both grew up in Ohio, but moved to the East Coast for better job opportunities shortly after they got married. I was born about a year after. Every year we made a trip back to Ohio to visit and stay with my grandparents for a week or two. Personally, I prefer the bigger cities to the part of Ohio my grandparents lived in. It was pretty rural and not too far from the West Virginia border. They had a little ranch house that was decent, but it really got packed when we stayed with them, especially after my two siblings were born. The only summer I ever missed going to Ohio was my junior year when I went to Italy for a school trip, and I felt bad because about a month later my grandpa passed away. But the family got to see him and spend time with him beforehand, so that was some consolation. About a week after his death, my parents told us we were all heading back to Ohio for the funeral. It was about a six-hour drive to their house, and I rode with my younger brother in my car and my sister rode with our parents. We arrived just after dark, and after eating a dinner my grandma prepared, everyone was full and tired from the drive. The next day there was a little service at a church my grandparents went to, and then the actual burial at the town cemetery, which was about 20 minutes away from my grandparents' house. Afterwards, Grandma was having people over for a reception and lunch. I met a lot of their friends from the area, and because it was very rural, many people seemed different than me. But everyone was nice in general. My siblings and I were pretty beat from the drive down and the service and burial, so we ate and then went outside to try and decompress. Grams and Gramps owned a little over eight acres that backed up to a decent-sized hill that wasn't quite a mountain. It was covered in oak trees and looked dense this time of year. Grandpa had a deer stand somewhere in there, and we decided to troop out to it and just reminisce a little and get some peace. None of us had been to the deer stand since we were kids, so it took some floundering around in the woods before we found it. It looked like Grandpa hadn't used it in a while and no one wanted to climb up and test it out. But we settled down on the ground underneath and just chatted, which was nice. We siblings didn't always get along great, but Gramps' passing brought us a little closer together. My brother Michael was talking about wanting to go on the same Italy trip I'd just gotten back from when we heard a sort of hollow thud. We looked around because it was a weird sound, and then it stayed silent for a while, and we went back to chatting. But not soon after there were four more thuds in quick succession, to me it definitely sounded like rocks hitting trees and bouncing off. My sister Carrie stood up right away and said she wanted to go back to the house. I could tell the sound spooked her. We were about a ten-minute walk into the woods. 
I tried to stay calm as I stood too, but I realized that the woods were actually a little too quiet. Quieter than normal. No birds or squirrels jumping around, which is usually a sign that bigger predators are in the area. Grandpa taught us that when we were little, but I wasn't sure if my siblings remembered it. Trying to stay chill so Carrie didn't get any more freaked out, I started ushering us back the way we'd come and talking loudly about whatever I could think of to distract my sister. Mike was starting to look freaked out too. Then he stopped abruptly and pointed and said, Bear, but the word came out more like a question. The thing he was pointing at was hunched over in a red-brown color, which didn't look like any bears around here. It was also huge, easily bigger than a cow. And as we stared at it, it straightened up. I realized it was bipedal and looking at us, but where I expected to see a bear's snout and ears, the face was very human-like. Still covered in hair, but there was a human nose, and I could see the shape of an ear. It was about 150 feet away. Carrie took off running immediately, and Mike and I did too. We were completely freaked out and booked it back to the house and inside. Grandma must have seen us from one of the windows, because she pulled us aside and asked what was wrong. Carrie was too scared to talk, but I explained what we saw, kind of embarrassed because I knew it sounded crazy. To my surprise, Grandma waved it off. She said Grandpa always talked about seeing those things out in the woods. Apparently, there were two to four of them, but they were usually further back up in the hill area. She said, I wonder if they know he passed and came down to pay their respects. That sounded absolutely crazy to me, but as I've gotten older, I wonder the same thing. Grandma passed away two years later, and after that day, I talked to her a few more times about what we'd seen. She never saw them herself since she didn't go out in the woods much, but she talked about Grandpa coming into contact with them a few times and giving them space. He was eventually convinced they were Bigfoot, but Gramps was so even-keeled that he never worried about it or cared to report it. After Grandma passed, my parents and their siblings ended up selling off the acreage in the house, so I never got to go back and find out if Grandpa was right. But somewhere near the West Virginia border of Ohio, there are big hairy creatures with human features hanging out in the woods. I am an officer with the New Jersey State Park Police and I cover the Wharton State Forest. I grew up around the Pine Barrens and everyone knows about the Jersey Devil. I heard all the stories, but to me, it was just an urban legend. The Pine Barrens is considered one of the most haunted areas in the country. It's rich with history and folklore and littered with abandoned ghost towns, the remnants of once bustling iron, paper, and terracotta industries. While the Jersey Devil may be the most infamous resident, he's hardly alone. This brings in a lot of self-proclaimed ghost hunters. One afternoon, I responded to a call about a car accident near one of the abandoned towns. A car had driven off the embankment and crashed into a tree. It was a group of teens and thankfully no one was hurt, but they were absolutely terrified. Apparently, they were snooping around the ruins looking for a ghostly woman who reportedly haunted the area. Instead, they saw something even more shocking, and they were convinced it was the Jersey Devil. They showed me some blurry pictures, several of a shadowy figure deep in the woods. It could have been a hiker for all I knew, although it appeared to be somewhat misshapen. They had a few more pictures of something flying in the sky that looked suspiciously like a big vulture. It was clear they believed it, but it's not the first time I've seen this kind of photographic evidence, and as usual, it was hardly convincing. Nonetheless, I listened as we waited for a tow truck. They could tell I wasn't buying it, and as they left, one of them challenged me to go check it out for myself, while the others warned me to stay away. It was getting late, but the ghost town was pretty close, and I decided to have a look. Not for ghosts or the Jersey Devil, but to make sure the kids didn't damage anything. It's not uncommon to find graffiti and trash left at these places. The ghost town was a short hike off an old dirt road. I hadn't visited this particular place before, and I admit it was pretty creepy, especially in the waning sunlight. There was no town left, so to speak, just mounds of dirt and the scattered remains of old brick mills and stone foundations, overrun by foliage and trees. Everything looked okay, and as I was about to leave, I was assaulted by the smell of sulfur. 
That's when I noticed how quiet it had become, as if the chirping birds and buzzing insects just disappeared. It was unnerving. I looked around and something caught my eye. About 25 yards away, lurking in the forest at the edge of the ruins was a shadowy silhouette. It was hard to get a clear look through the trees, but it did kind of resemble the figure in those pictures the kids took. It looked like it was wearing a trench coat, or maybe a cape, and there was something strange about the shape of its head, like it was wearing a mask or hat. I called out to whoever it was and started to make my way back to the ruins. The figure didn't say anything, just stood perfectly still. I couldn't make out its face, but I could feel it looking at me. What happened next was the most bizarre and terrifying thing that I ever witnessed. I called out to the figure again, and as I got closer, I quickly learned that it wasn't a trench coat it was wearing. They were wings, enrobed around the figure, and they suddenly unfurled into a span of maybe twenty feet. For a brief second, I caught a glimpse of the creature. It had the skeletal head of a goat with horns, its body scaled like a lizard. Then it made the most inhuman, ungodly shriek before shooting up and disappearing over the treetops. I stood there, frozen. Did I just see the Jersey Devil? I got out of there fast and didn't look back. I jumped in my car and sat there a minute, my adrenaline still racing. Now I knew why those kids were so scared. I got my head together and started the drive into town. It was twilight at that point and I was on a dark, lonely stretch of road. I kept replaying the events in my mind, going back and forth between was that or wasn't that what I think it was. An unearthly shriek pierced the air and snapped me out of my reverie. The same shriek that thing made before taking flight. Then something heavy landed on the roof with a loud thump, causing me to swerve it. I panicked, thinking the Jersey Devil came back to finish me off. I heard the sound of scratching metal as something was ripped from the roof. I glanced in the rearview mirror and saw the emergency light bar clattering across the road in pieces behind me. The car shook as something banged on the roof. I couldn't see what it was, and there was no way I was going to stick my head out the window. I don't know how long I drove like that, but it felt like forever. I heard that shriek again and the car rattled as the creature took off. I could literally feel the weight lifting as I was able to gain better control of the steering wheel. I saw the tips of the creature's wings pass briefly in front of my headlights. Then it was gone. I floored it back to the station and when I got there I noticed I was gripping the wheel so tight my knuckles were white. Another officer came out and gasped, pointing at my car. I got out and looked at the roof, which was shredded, the light bar mounts twisted and torn apart. The officer asked me what happened, and when I said it was the Jersey Devil, he laughed. I almost visited those kids to corroborate our experiences, but I thought it best to leave well enough alone. Even in my report, I stated that I had carelessly skimmed a low-hanging branch. The department wasn't happy, but I was too ashamed to tell them the truth, or at least what I thought was the truth. A few weeks later, another officer came up to me in private and said that he, too, had an experience with the Jersey Devil. He never said anything about it because he was afraid of being ridiculed. I felt a sense of relief, even validation, knowing that I wasn't the only one. I've thought about going to the authorities with what we saw out there in the woods, but they might think we are insane or making a joke. There's no question about it. This is potentially dangerous. There is a creature out in the woods that endangered my friends and almost killed me. Something has to be done. I am a logger living in Northwest Oregon. I've lived up here my entire life. These woods are my home. My father and my grandfather were loggers with the same company. I remember watching them cut down trees. Rather than go to ball games or do Boy Scouts, I sat in the passenger seat of 18-wheelers lugging logs across the state. When the time came to take over the business from my dad, it was one of the happiest days of my life. My friends celebrated with me and I even got to hire a few of them. We began to turn a decent profit and became known in the area for being the best logging company in the Pacific Northwest. It was the 4th of July. All my guys were off and celebrating. I was planning on meeting them when we heard from a private landowner. He was the wealthy type, 
and the kind that liked things done on his timetable. We don't usually give these guys the time of day, but whenever I did a job for him, he paid double our price. And sometimes extra, his wife made us lobster rolls too. He had an extra Range Rover that he didn't want anymore. It was free to me for doing some light arborist work. All this to say, when he calls, we answer. It looks like all he wanted was a few of us to act as fallers. He had some old trees he wanted us to take down. An easy job. Super straightforward. Just a bit tedious. My buddy Todd and I set to work and ended up cutting well into the night. He was getting a little pissed off, but I reminded him of the payday. So we decided to make camp for the night and pick up first thing in the morning. That way it would be out of our hair and we could keep it moving. I pitched a tent for us while Todd made a fire. Even though we missed the festivities of the day, we drank a few beers around the fire and grilled hot dogs. I've known Todd since we were kids and he always knew how to make a bummer situation a little more palatable. We spent a few hours telling jokes and drinking until we decided to get some shut-eye. The tent ended up being a bit warm, so I decided to sleep out under the stars. It was a beautiful summer night. The stars are always more visible out here in the woods than in my backyard. Eventually, the sound of the wind and the swaying of the trees sent me to sleep. I woke a few hours later in the pitch dark. The stars weren't out anymore. The wind was no longer blowing in the trees. Everything was very still. It felt like it happened in an instant. Like I blinked and this stillness set in all at once. In the distance, I heard a roar. Loud, blood-curdling. Echoing through the forest. All my hairs stood up on end as I reached for a flashlight. When I clicked it on, it was super bright. It beamed directly into the deep woods. The roar happens again. The breeze came back. I crab walk over to the tent and kick it for Todd to wake up. Slowly he unzips the tent. He's white as a sheet. I know just from his face that he's hearing this roar also. We know what bears sound like, and we know how to handle them. Todd liked to call them giant raccoons. This sound was different. In hindsight, we were scared, but also curious. Only a very large creature could make a noise like this. Bigger than a bear. I don't know of any animals in the United States that are bigger than bears. The next moment, a tree fell about a hundred yards from camp. It was a big old tree, probably something we would have cut the next morning. It slammed into another tree, and that one fell too. Todd looked me dead in the eyes. Slowly he raised his flashlight in the direction of the fallen tree and turned it on. We were right. The creature was huge, much bigger than a bear. It was on all fours like a bear. It had that similar giant head. But this creature had no fur, just bare skin. I could see its muscles shifting under its tough skin. Whatever it was, it pushed over a tree like it was nothing. It roared once again and turned in our direction. It stared into the glare of our flashlight and in our shock came at us at a run. We did the only thing our instinct knew to get us away. We climbed a tree. Neither of us slept that night. It seemed like an age passed before the sun came up. We were up in a tree high enough that it must have lost our smell. Looking down, our tent and camp was torn to shreds. It looked like a whole pack of bears descended on it, rather than this one large one. In the morning, we got down the tree and got whatever of our stuff we could salvage. Moving quickly, as quietly as we can, we jumped into our truck and booked it back to my place. I don't know what it was, but it could have killed us. Anyone who lives in our neck of the woods better be careful out there. No camping. Not until we know more about what's going on. Some cities get all of the attention, don't they? Something strange happens in New York and Florida. It's viral on social media within the hour. But strange things happen in the Ozarks all the time, but nobody seems to care. I live in Benton County, Arkansas. Plenty of strange things have happened here, but only one strange thing has happened to me. That's what I want to talk about. I like the strange. When I hear something odd or unexplainable has happened, I run in that direction. I like the mystery of it all. 
I always wanted to feel like I was a part of something special, and special somethings didn't come through Benton County very often. Until 2016, that is. Two years prior, someone reportedly saw a strange creature wandering through the edge of the Ozark National Forest. It became my fixation. No one could prove that the man hadn't seen what he claimed, and I wanted to see it too. I made myself like hiking, and I went out every day that I could and walked the longest and least popular trails. I just wanted to catch a glimpse of that thing, you know? I wanted to be a part of that story. I was an idiot. A few people took notice of my repeat visits. National Park Service, I guess. I don't blame them for keeping an eye on me. I do blame them for what ended up happening, though. They made me the latest in a long list of Benton County idiots. As I was saying, it was 2016. I was on one of my usual hikes. I didn't notice anyone following me that day. I thought the rangers had gotten bored by then. I spotted something on the trail ahead of me, a small gray furry shape that didn't immediately resemble a fox or a rabbit. I was worried that it might be a little mountain lion cub. I've seen mother lions chase people off of trails. I didn't want that to be the story I ended up in. But what if the cub wasn't a lion, I thought. What if it was exactly the creature I was looking for? I moved closer. When my feet shifted on the ground, the small animal saw me. It turned and pointed its flat feline nose in my direction. Right away, I saw the two horn-like stumps growing from the top of its head. The little critter opened its mouth and made a pitiful mewling sound, like a baby whining after a long nap. It made me smile. It wasn't what I had been looking for, but it was certainly interesting. It was weird, too. Then something screamed from the tree line to my left. It screamed how a human woman might scream, how a human woman might scream if she was afraid for her life. I felt every bone in my body grow cold that very moment. When I turned to look, I could only vaguely decipher the shape of the mother creature from its place in the shadows of the Ozarks. It looked like a big cat. Maybe a lion wasn't so far off. Its face was flat and two antlers protruded from its head. Its tail looked naked too, maybe like a rat's. Maybe it had mange. I wasn't sure then and I'm not sure now. All I'm sure of is that when the beast opened its mouth, it cried in a way that only people should cry. It shrieked at me. It shrilled as it urged me away. I shouldn't have ran. I had gone looking for this thing, right? And I know running is the last thing you want to do when you're caught by a mama defending her young. I ran anyway. Fighting or freezing or backing away slowly, none of that even occurred to me. I ran and I heard it run behind me. It screamed while it chased me. It screamed so loud that I thought my ears might bleed. There was no telling how close it was either, not with a scream like that. Suddenly I wasn't alone on the trail. I was running past two park rangers. There were more following behind them. I kept running. Only after a half dozen rangers passed me by did I even consider that the monster was no longer behind me. The three gunshots that erupted behind me forced me to hit the ground. I landed on my hands and knees. I felt like my heart and lungs were exploding. When they didn't, I looked up. Some of the rangers were already coming back down the trail, shaking their heads and complaining about the run. I asked in disbelief, hadn't they seen it? No, they said. There was nothing there besides my screaming. Why was that gun fired? I asked. What gun? Even the ranger who emerged from the top of the trail with scuffs from his palms to his elbows insisted that they saw nothing in the woods. They didn't see or hear anything chasing me down that trail. I had never been so mad. When I got back to town, I told anyone who would listen. I told them what I'd seen and how the Park Service had reacted. The Park Service, of course, spun a yarn to make me look like the imbecile. They told my friends that I was found dehydrated in the woods. I had been drinking, they said, and got turned around. The sun had scrambled my mind and made me hallucinate. What choice did my friends have except to believe them? They all knew how desperate I was to be a part of a strange adventure. It didn't seem unreasonable to think that my mind invented a story when my body couldn't find one. But I know the truth. 
I know what I saw and what they saw and what they had to do in order to protect themselves. I know there's something deadly in the Ozarks. Next time I'm going to take its picture. I recently experienced a disturbing series of events that are hands down the scariest thing that ever happened to me. I work at a demolition company, and we were hired to raise a house in a suburb of Omaha, Nebraska. The house was in foreclosure and sat abandoned for many years. The bank was unable to sell the property, and the house began to deteriorate, becoming an eyesore in the neighborhood. Ultimately, the bank decided to tear it down while it considered what to do with the lot. I admit the house was a bit creepy in its rundown condition, but that didn't mean it was haunted. It's not like we heard rumors about it either, and it wasn't anything that crossed my mind as we did the initial inspections. That is, until we went in the basement and noticed an area of carpet that looked like it was stained with black mold. The carpet wasn't wet or anything, but after we tore it up, we found a trap door hidden underneath. It was closed pretty snugly, and when we pried it open, we discovered a small cubicle, about five feet by five feet, with the walls and floor comprised of wooden planks crudely put together. The odd thing was, carved into them were these weird symbols. At first I thought they were satanic, but upon closer look, they were something else, maybe something archaic and pagan. Stranger still, there were words etched into the planks, but it was a language I didn't recognize. Scattered on the floor were several charred, decomposed bird skeletons and other small bones. It looked like some kind of ritual sacrifice or offering. Who knows what its purpose was, but it wasn't something that would stop us from doing our job. We completed our inspection, made sure all the permits were in order, and were scheduled to begin demolition the following day. The job would take about five days total. The first day went off without a hitch, but the second day we ran into mechanical and electrical problems with our hydraulic excavator and other equipment. Incidentally, it happened just as we were digging up the basement in that cubicle. The machinery was fine before. There's no reason why it should suddenly crap out on us. Later that night, the really weird stuff started happening. After my wife and kids went upstairs to bed, I was in my home office working on a bid when I heard people talking in the living room. I thought my wife and kids came back downstairs, but when I called out to them, they didn't respond. I walked out to the living room, and the voices suddenly became whispers, like they knew I was coming and tried to quiet down. The living room was dark, but I could still make out the silhouettes of furniture, and there was clearly no one there. But in the split second before I flipped the light switch, I swear I saw a tall, shadowy figure standing in the far corner. It stood maybe seven feet, and I could make out the outline of a trench coat and top hat. As soon as I turned on the light, the voices stopped and the figure disappeared. Sure enough, the living room was empty. I thought I was seeing and hearing things. Then I felt this really malevolent vibe as chills ran up my spine. I didn't want to be downstairs alone anymore, so I closed up my office and went upstairs to bed. A few hours later, I was awoken by the sound of loud footsteps running back and forth in the hallway. It didn't seem to wake up my wife, so I got up to see what was going on. As soon as I opened the bedroom door, the footsteps stopped, but at the end of the darkened hallway, I saw that tall shadow figure with the top hat again, just standing there. I quickly turned on a light, but again the figure disappeared. I have to admit it shook me, so I left the light on. It was hard to go back to sleep, and I kept drifting in and out, waking up at every little sound, real or imagined. In one of my stupors, I swear I saw that shadow figure standing at the foot of my bed, but as soon as I snapped awake, it was gone. It left me petrified with this overwhelming feeling of dread, and I felt like it was just playing with me. The next day at the site, I was exhausted and noticed the other guys looked just as sleep-deprived as me. We got to talking and I found out that each of them saw the exact same shadow figure with the top hat in their own homes. We were all spooked. We couldn't help but think about that cubicle in the basement. Did we disturb something we weren't supposed to? Was it some kind of witchcraft? 
We tried to get to work but ran into the same mechanical problems as the day before. Finally, I suggested getting a priest to come and bless the site before continuing any further. Everyone agreed, even the one guy that wasn't religious and didn't believe in the supernatural. We went to my local church and told one of the priests what was going on. He listened and could see how scared we were. He came down to the site and blessed the area and said some prayers. Then he was gracious enough to go to each of our homes and say some prayers there as well. It seemed to do the trick. The next day we had no issues with the machinery and were able to get back on schedule. In fact, we were so eager to demolish that house, we actually finished a day early. None of us saw that shadow figure again either. It took me a few days to settle down and stop peering into the darkness to try to find it. I still have no idea what it was, why it appeared, and how it connected to that house. Even though the priest seemed to put an end to it, I feared for whatever would be built on that lot and for whoever would eventually move in there. By the grace of God, I hope the prayers were strong enough to keep it away for good. Back in 2008, with the economic downturn, I lost my job. The job I'd had in finance got completely upended. I knew I'd need to reinvent myself, and I even went back to live with my parents in Utah while I figured things out. I ended up going in a completely different direction and enrolling in a police academy. I appreciated being able to move back home for a while. It was mutually beneficial since I was able to help my mom and dad out a lot around the house while I was in training. They also said it made them feel safer than ever. On my end, the field training that I was taking created an awareness I'd never had before. My parents' house is on a secluded private drive. It's a two-story house with a walkout basement. During the time that this all happened, they had left town for a couple weeks to visit my sister in another state. I was taking care of the house and their dog, Henry. He was a collie mix and the most obedient and sweetest dog ever. During that time, I was studying for the post, which stands for Peace Officer Standards and Training Board, requires a written test as part of the preparation for the officer selection process. It's similar to college entrance exams like the ACT or SAT. So I'd been studying a lot for it and had invited my fellow cadet Nick over so we could work together one evening. It was getting dark. Henry the dog was in the living room with us and was sleeping when he suddenly jumped up and looked out the window growling. I had never heard him make noises like that before. His hair was up from his neck to the base of his tail. I looked out the window but couldn't see anything and I closed the window and the curtain. It was a bit unusual to see Henry acting so strange. Nick was wondering if Henry had heard a coyote or something. I went and checked the locks with Henry following me. I knew that the closest neighbors were also out of town. Their house was just on the other side of a few larger trees, so I felt pretty alone up there. Henry calmed back down and went to lay on the rug, so I calmed down too. I figured if he was relaxed, everything was probably fine. We were quizzing each other from the practice test, and suddenly Henry went crazy again. He was growling and snarling viciously, which was totally out of character for him. I turned out the lights and looked out the living room window. I didn't see anything on that side of the house either. I wanted to get a good look out the back of the house, but to do that, I would have to go downstairs. However, Henry would not follow me. I decided to go look out from our back deck. It was a high deck that didn't have any stairs off of it, so I figured I'd be safe. I turned off all the lights and the outdoor floodlights so I could get some night vision. Then I slowly opened the door and went out on the deck. It was quiet outside. The driveway was empty and the area by the shed was clear. But still it felt creepy out there and I had a strong urge to go back inside. But first I made myself go over to the far side of the deck and look out in the direction of the neighbor's house. They did have their outdoor lights on and under their deck I spotted a moving shadow. It looked tall. At first I thought it was a man standing by the deck support. It crept further out from under the deck and I just gasped. It had to be seven feet tall. And it was no man. 
It continued to come closer to me and soon I could see that it was staring right at me as it approached. All I could focus on was its eyes, its freaky eyes. I feel nervous just writing this. It felt like evil was looking at me. It looked grayish. It was naked and pale and so gaunt looking. I could see its ribs straining against the skin. Soon it was right below the deck and was crouched down on all fours and I got so creeped out. I had the feeling that if it wanted to, it would be able to spring all the way up to the deck. It kept looking at me and hissing and clicking. Then it sprinted away into the trees faster than I would have ever believed it could have moved. I ran back into the house and locked the door. I grabbed the dog and yelled at Nick to follow me down the hall to my dad's study. I locked the door and took two guns out of the gun safe and loaded them. Nick was freaked out because I wasn't saying anything. Just loading guns that he didn't even know we had, or that I knew how to use. Then I positioned myself and watched out the window with my loaded pistol while I tried to explain to Nick what I had seen. I couldn't even tell if I was making any sense as I talked. I told Nick to call the precinct and get somebody out there. He was reluctant because I think he thought I was going crazy. But he did it, and the precinct sent out a squad car. We stayed locked in that room until the police arrived. By the time they did, Henry had calmed down, so I was really hoping that the thing had gone. The officers came and did a whole sweep of the outside area, even over at the neighbors, and looked for signs of anything unusual, but they didn't find anything. I didn't back down from my story, though. That thing was real, and I could tell it was dangerous. I think they believed me. I mean, I wasn't known as a flaky person, but there wasn't much they could do. This story still freaks me out so much even though I never saw that thing. Whatever that was could be anywhere, and I do not want to meet it alone or unarmed. There's something in the Appalachian Mountains that you got to see to believe. I was walking through the woods with my boyfriend a few weeks ago, and he was doing that thing he does that I hate, which is walking so fast that I can barely keep up pet peeve of mine. Also, I was getting winded, and this was not what I was thinking when I said I wanted us to do a day hike. I was thinking of a pleasant afternoon, kind of romantic, but he was turning it into a forced march and I was getting frustrated. A couple times I had to call out to him to wait up, and he'd just stand there looking all impatient. Anyway, now I was really ticked off, so I decided to teach him a lesson. The trail was winding around, and he was getting further and further ahead of me, and when it rounded a corner he just disappeared from sight, like he didn't even care that he was so far off in front. So I just thought, to hell with him, I'll give him reason to worry, and then maybe he won't do it again. So I went off trail. Now I'm not stupid, I know you can get lost easy, but I was irritated, and wanting to prove a point. The whole time I'm doing this, I'm keeping my ears peeled, thinking I'd hear Brian start calling my name any minute. I walked for like 10 minutes, trying not to go too far from the trail, just kind of walked parallel to it. I had to stop and pee, so I went behind a big tree, even though I wasn't visible to the trail, but habit, I guess. While I was squatting there, I heard a rustling up above me. At first, I thought it was just squirrels or something, but then I had this weird feeling like someone was watching me. It freaked me out, especially because I was in this vulnerable position, so I quickly got my pants pulled up. I started walking again, and I kept looking behind me, thinking someone was following me. Just a weird feeling, but my body must have known something because the hair on my arms was standing up. At first, I told myself I imagined it. Then I started wondering if it was my boyfriend, and maybe he was going to jump out at me to teach me a lesson. I hate that, by the way, when someone scares you for a laugh. I stopped at one point and talked into the woods behind me saying, Okay, Brian, I hear you, and then I waited, but he didn't come out. The longer I looked at the woods behind me, the more uneasy I was getting, so I started walking again. I was really disappointed that I wasn't hearing Brian yelling my name. I mean, did he not even notice I was gone? Or he just didn't care? My brain was taking me in all directions. I then stopped to listen again, thinking he had gotten far away when I heard this noise above me. A crackling of branches and leaves swishing. Kind of sound. 
I got a little nervous because it sounded too big to be squirrels or anything else you'd normally find in a tree. It sounded big. I had just decided to turn around and start reversing my path back to the main trail when I heard a cough. A human cough. No mistaking it. But it came from above. I looked up into the branches of this big oak tree, one of those ancient ones, and at first I didn't see anything, but all of a sudden I saw movement, and I saw him. At least parts of him. It was a man, but he looked odd, like really hairy. Now, I'm not talking about Bigfoot kind of hairy, this was just a really hairy guy with an overgrown beard and long, shaggy hair. The skin on his face looked similar to a dark tan, I guess, with facial hair covering most of it. It was the fact that he was up in a tree, way off the trail, watching me, that completely freaked me out. I looked up at him and yelled, Stay away! I was thinking this was the creep that had watched me peeing a few minutes ago when I heard that noise. But that didn't really make sense, because that incident had happened about 20 yards back, and I don't think people can just move from tree to tree like monkeys. Right after I yelled, the guy jumped down to a lower limb like he was coming for me. His eyes were focused on me, and he didn't even need to be careful or look around as he came down. Now all eyes were no me. I lost my cool and just ran like hell back in the direction I'd come. I was frantic, trying to run as fast as I could, but I had to swerve quickly a few times when I realized I had taken the wrong way. Next, I heard a thud behind me and I started praying, but a second later the guy grabbed me from behind, one arm in a headlock, the other arm around my shoulders and chest. I started screaming my head off and grabbed at his arm, scratching and trying to pull him off me. His arm was weird looking, and that frightened me even more than I already was. Super muscular and he had really dry skin on his hands, but it was all wrinkled like a raisin. His arm was hairy, all the way down to his wrist. I didn't turn around to see his face, but I got to tell you, the guy had the worst smell of any living creature I've ever experienced. I'm screaming my head off, and he's trying to drag me over to a tree, and he's winning. Suddenly I hear my boyfriend, thank God. He was calling my name frantically. He sounded pretty close, but couldn't see me, and that's when the hairy man let me go. I yelled, here, and I spun around trying to see where Brian was. I then watched as the man just leapt up into the tree, almost running straight up the trunk. It was supernatural, almost. Super fast, looking like he did it all the time. But I wasted no time running toward Brian's voice, and I didn't stick around to see where the guy went. Brian was there in a clearing and I ran straight into his arms, shaking like crazy. I blubbered out my whole story, and he held me because I was shaking so hard. Once he understood what I was telling him, he got all tense, looking around like he wanted to find the guy. But I begged him for us to just leave, and he finally said okay, but he made us stop at the local police department and report it. They acted like I was a wacko when I told them the guy was in the trees. But they took my report, and then we just went home. So what the heck was this thing? I'm telling you, it was not a creature like Bigfoot. It was definitely a man. But a man who climbed the trees like a monkey. I shouldn't be alive to tell this story. I don't know if it was pure luck or some greater being was looking out for me, but two nights ago I almost lost my life to something. I'm an amateur bird watcher, and Long Island where I live has a surprising number of different species to observe. I've spent a lot of time in the few county and state parks in the area and have a large catalog of hundreds of specimens I have photographed. My white whale, if you will, is a snowy owl. They typically live in the northern reaches of Canada, but during the winter they migrate south and a few make it to the shores of Long Island. I have been trying for several years to even catch a glimpse of one, but always to no avail. Still, this past weekend I gathered together my gear and planned on exploring a stretch of open beach I'd rarely been to. It was out east and that part of Long Island is much less populated. I have a mid-tier camera that I use as well as a cheap pair of binoculars from Walmart. I couldn't afford much more. 
I got to the beach around 9 in the morning and of course it was completely abandoned. Only weirdos who like birds visit the beach in winter, I guess. I walked for about two miles along the beach. Despite not catching sight of my quarry, I was enjoying myself. The cold air and sense of isolation were actually invigorating. I spend most of my days in an overheated office building with constant background chatter all around me. I hit my predetermined hallway mark and decided I should head back now. About 30 minutes away from my car, I decided to take a little rest and just look out over the ocean. I climbed to the top of one of the higher dunes and took a seat. It had only been a few minutes when I saw something odd in the water. I was about 100 yards from the shoreline, and this thing was probably another 100 yards out in the water, so I couldn't really get a good look at it. Whatever it was, it had a long, thin, white body, a stark contrast to the murky blue waters it was swimming through. Again, the distance made it difficult, but I guessed that it was 30 or 40 feet long. Its color ruled out a downed tree, and anyway, it was propelling itself through the water, not floating along with the current. The thought crossed my mind that it might be a sturgeon, but it appeared much larger than even the largest known sturgeons ever caught. I snapped a few pics, but it was so far and the sun was so bright that you wouldn't even be able to make it out in the photos. I decided to head down towards the water to see if I could get a better look. That turned out to be an awful idea. I lost sight of the creature as I climbed down the dune. The higher elevations had given me a better vantage point, and down here on the sand, I was level with the water. As I made my way across the beach heading towards the water, I stopped to try to clean the lens on my camera. Standing still, I could hear an odd sputtering overtop the gentle lapping of the waves. I looked up and heading straight towards me was the thin white line of the creature, cutting atop the surface of the water like a shark's fin. Watching this thing moving through the water like an arrow was a surreal experience, and I stood transfixed but I quickly snapped out of it as it hit the shoreline and emerged from the water. It had the head of a snake attached to a long, bony-looking body. The sun glinted off its stark white body as it flashed across the top of the sand. I turned and ran as fast as I could, but beating through the dry sand was an exercise in futility. The thing was moving at twice the speed I could move, and I probably only had another ten seconds before it was upon me. In a complete panic and not knowing what else to do, I ripped my camera from around my neck and threw it as hard as possible at the creature. I'd never played baseball and was hardly athletic, but something was guiding my throw that day, and the heavy camera slammed right against the creature's face. It reared its head up and began violently shaking it back and forth while the last ten-foot segment of the creature whipped back and forth across the sand, spraying a gritty cloud into the air all about it. I took the opportunity to finish my dash up the dune and ran down to the road after climbing over it. I made steady progress down the road and kept throwing looks over my shoulder. Sure enough, the creature had regained its composure and came bursting over the top of the dune onto the road behind me. It was moving even faster atop the cold pavement and gaining quickly. I had no camera to throw this time and was sure that I only had a few moments to live. The thing that happened next is what truly made me reconsider my agnostic beliefs in a higher power. Hooting like a barking dog, a flash of white erupted from a nearby clump of bushes. A thick body attached to a pair of thick flapping wings rocketed past and over me, right in the direction of the creature. A snowy owl, the same creature I had set out to observe. Looking over my shoulder while running, the snake creature caught sight of the owl and stretched its long body out snatching the poor owl from mid-flight. I tripped in surprise and sprawled on the ground. I watched as the snake thing, owl in its mouth, slammed its head into the pavement. The owl stopped its frantic flapping and lay still. Then, with a slowness that the creature hadn't yet exhibited, it turned its long body and began a deliberate slither up and over the dune. I didn't go to investigate, instead picking myself up and finishing the run to my car. I beat it out of there quickly and didn't catch sight of the creature again. I know this sounds made up. Even I struggle to believe that it happened. I don't know if that thing was some kind of undiscovered sea snake or something else unnatural. What I do know is that I'll be going to church this Sunday and probably everyone afterward.
When I lived in Ohio, I had a job working for the sheriff's department. I remember one of my first duties was patrolling a wooded area. From my understanding, it was one of those tasks no one wanted. So, being young and new, I was given the job. I didn't realize that I was given the grub work till much later in my employment, but hey, it was an interesting experience. As I understood it, the area was known to attract people often up to no good, or doing mischievous business. I had come to think of it as a lover's lane type of area, but it turned out it attracted a much different type of mischief. The night in question was one of those nights. Very warm, but kind of humid. This wasn't unusual for Ohio, but the days had been so hot that the rain didn't even help. It just sort of made everything sticky. So what felt like eight hours of patrol was actually only two hours. Time seemed to stand still that night in particular. Maybe it's because I was feeling a little overworked. The week had been especially long. And this specific night happened to be my Friday. I just really wanted to get home. Sometimes if the nights were calm, I would park for a while and just relax. This was one of those nights. It was pretty calm. No disruptions other than the uncomfortable feeling of the heat and wet air. So I paused my patrolling and parked. It doesn't sound like the most appropriate thing to do when on duty, meaning park and just relax. But I kind of let myself take the time as a mini mental break. But that's when it happened. I was soon radioed about multiple reports of an unusual green light just up the road from where I was sitting. I thought, of course this would happen. I didn't think anything would come of it, but I hopped into my vehicle and started circling again. I figured the green light might have best been explained by some kids who came to the woods looking for trouble. I circled and circled, but I didn't see anything like a green light. After about an hour or so, I decided to hop out of my vehicle again. I couldn't stand sitting in a car despite the humidity outside. Also, I was so bored at this point I started flashing my flashlight around in the trees. Maybe I'd spot those kids with their fireworks. I know this story makes me sound very irresponsible or like I wasn't working hard. But I didn't know how else to keep myself from falling asleep. And I was young. Not that that makes a difference. Anyway, I'm shining my flashlight around. I'm looking at some of the trees, and this all gets pretty boring pretty quickly. And so I turned my flashlight off and sat on the hood of my vehicle. I had even started to text friends when I started to hear someone approaching me. I could hear the sound of leaves crunching underfoot and some cracking, as if branches were being broken. I looked up. I didn't see anything. So I put my phone down, and I started looking all around. It was very dark and I was surrounded nearly completely by trees. This excluded the area of the dirt path and a strange makeshift parking area. Really, the parking area was just a rectangular piece of dirt. I still couldn't see anything. If it had been a person, I think I would have seen them. The trees were pretty tall, but the trunks were rather thin. The dense area of the leaves started probably about 12 feet from the ground. So a person should be noticeable, right? and I didn't hear anyone talking or giggling. That made it more bizarre. If it was a group of kids, they'd surely be making a lot of noise, usually laughing with them. But all I heard was a strange movement in the distance. I tried picturing pleasant things because I was starting to get a little freaked out. So a dog in the woods didn't seem very scary. I told myself that's what it was. I keep looking towards the trees and I noticed that one of the trees appeared to have moved in a strange way, like it was swaying. You know when you're out in the dark, and certain things look much darker than everything else? That's what these trees looked like in the dark. They looked darker than everything else, like a shadow of themselves, if that makes sense. And then I realized that the tree that moved, it no longer looked like a tree. It looked more like a very tall person, as in a 10-foot tall person, it looked like it had shoulders and arms and a neck and all other things like a human would. I told myself I was just hallucinating. The dark can do that to people. It's tricky. But then the shadow moved again. And this time I saw a distinct head. I didn't see a face. I'm just trying to clarify. Just the shadow of where its head would be. How did I know it was its head? Well, I could see its eyes. 
Its eyes were glowing this strange orange color. I was terrified. What was I to do? What was this thing? I don't have an answer for the last one. But before I could think, I found myself jumping into my patrol car and speeding off towards town. I started thinking about the reports of the green light and how this strange thing was in the woods. Did both incidents stem from each other? Like, did the shadow come from the green light? That wouldn't make much sense, would it? Or maybe it would. I'm not sure what I saw that night. I'm not sure if it was a creature from space or if it was one of those ape monsters that people are always talking about. All I know is it scared a lot of life out of me. Every cop has their share of crazy stories, but this one is definitely the highlight of my career. Back in the 80s, I was an officer in the Bridgeport Police Department. It's an industrial center on the coast of Connecticut. It's not a massive metroplex like Dallas or New York City, but it's big enough to have its share of crime. I worked the North End, up toward the border with Trumbull, in a residential area. Lots of duplexes and triplexes, so there were more families than you'd think based on the housing. The thing about being a neighborhood cop is that, at least back then, we got to know the people. There was always somebody good to give you gossip and a lot of time. That kind of connection helps you keep the peace better than anything the force tells you to do nowadays. My favorite neighbor, actually she was everybody's favorite neighbor, was Mrs. Belinsky. She was a sweet elderly woman in her 80s who owned a triplex in the middle of the block. She didn't have family close by, so everybody looked out for her. Mrs. Belinsky baked the best cookies, which she always had ready for me on Tuesday when I'd stop by. She'd smile and chat, and I'd make sure she didn't need anything before I kept going on my patrol. Fortunately, she lived in a pretty quiet neighborhood, so there weren't many problems. Sure, there was the occasional drunk neighbor, especially on Saturday night, or maybe there was a loud party every once in a while, but I never got a call to go to Mrs. Belinsky's place. Until the night I did. The call didn't come from her. It came from a neighbor. Like I said, everybody loved Mrs. Belinsky and made sure they looked out for her. So when the neighbor lady heard loud arguing coming from the Belinsky house, she called the station. I hadn't clocked out yet, so I came over as fast as I could to do a welfare check. I went in the rattling gate and knocked on the door. I knew it'd take Mrs. Belinsky a while to get to the door, so I made sure I listened for any raised voices, since that's what the neighbor complaint said. When Mrs. Belinsky finally got to the door, she was in her housecoat and carrying her little white poodle. She didn't seem to be in distress, but the dog looked a little agitated. Still, Mrs. Belinsky was surprised to see me. Apparently, she hadn't heard anything. She didn't have tenants at the moment, so she couldn't imagine why her neighbor would say she heard yelling. Since she wasn't in danger and I couldn't hear anything, I asked if I could make a perimeter check of her property to make sure everything was closed up tight. She didn't have a problem with that. I walked around tapping the windows to make sure none of them were loose and checking the door locks. The front of the house was fine, but the big backyard, overgrown in some spots, made me nervous. It was dark and had some bushes that would make great cover for anyone trying to sneak around. I didn't see any signs that anyone had been there, but there was something about the yard that just made my skin crawl. Still, I didn't see any intruders or signs of trespassers, so I had to report to Mrs. Belinsky that everything was fine. I told her to call if she heard anything, then I left. Everything seemed to go back to normal. I checked in with the neighbor who'd made the initial report, and she hadn't heard anything. I asked casually if she'd seen anything or anyone in the backyard. Turns out her teenage son mowed Mrs. Belinsky's lawn for her, but he never said he saw anything. I chalked it up to a loud TV. Mrs. Belinsky was half deaf and considered the matter closed. Until the next Tuesday night, when a different neighbor called the precinct to report what sounded like a man yelling at Mrs. Belinsky's house. I sped over there, lights and sirens, jerked open the gate and sprinted up the steps. As I pounded on the storm door, the yelling cut off like someone had yanked the plug on it. The hair on the back of my neck was already standing up, and the feeling only got worse as I waited for Mrs. Belinsky to come to the door. When she didn't, well, 
You don't have to be a cop to realize what was going through my head. By now, some of the neighbors were standing around, hanging at the fence line. I pounded on the door one more time and announced I was the police. Still nothing. I could hear sirens in the distance and new backup was coming, but I didn't want to wait. Not with the life of one elderly lady potentially hanging in the balance. I kicked open the door and went in. I knew the layout of Mrs. Belinsky's first floor since I'd been there. The front room parlor, where she had all her best furniture, was empty. The doorway opposite me led to the dining room, then the kitchen. I knew she watched her shows in her little sitting room off the dining room. If she was doing her usual thing and just hadn't heard me, I knew she'd be in there. I was listening for any sounds, any sounds at all, but other than the sounds of the street outside, I didn't hear anything. I moved left, gun drawn and held low and ready, and eased around the corner to peek into the sitting room. Mrs. Belinsky was in her rocking chair, either asleep or unconscious. She didn't appear to be injured and there were no other signs of an intruder, but that didn't mean I relaxed. Her dog was missing. I holstered my service weapon and tried to wake Mrs. Belinsky up. To say she was surprised to see me was an understatement. Once I explained what had happened, I asked where her poodle was. She didn't know. That bad feeling had never really left, but now it came back with a vengeance. I got Mrs. Belinsky outside with the neighbors and promised I'd look for her dog. I figured if the poodle wasn't with her owner, it probably wasn't on the first floor. I went through the door that led to the second floor apartment. The layout was similar to Mrs. Belinsky's, with a hallway leading to the third floor stair in the back. Mrs. Belinsky's apartment was homey and old-fashioned. These untenanted floors were unsettling. Weird. The floors creaked under my weight, but the further into the space I went, the more muffled the sound seemed to be. I almost felt like I was underwater. Everything seemed to come to me slowly. Sound. Thoughts. Everything. But the place was empty. I headed for the stairway to the last apartment. As soon as my shoe touched that steep painted stair, I heard yelling. I couldn't make out what was being said, but there was very clearly an argument. Male and female voices. Training kicked in. I started up the stairs, my pulse pounding in my ears. I knew there were ten stairs. I knew because I counted them. But even though I knew that, I felt like I was climbing them forever. It was like the minutes were being stretched out like taffy by hands I couldn't see, for a reason I didn't understand. Finally, I broke all my training and looked down at each step as I took it, mentally walking myself through the motions of, I'm picking up my foot. I'm placing my foot on the next step. My foot is on the step. I'm moving up. It sounds utterly ridiculous now that I'm writing this, but then it was the only way I could seem to move at all. Then I got to the third floor landing. The door to the next apartment was right there. I could hear that argument again, but I still couldn't make out what they were saying. I felt like I was hearing everything underwater. I'm ashamed of this, but I broke out in goosebumps. I mean, I wasn't a rookie and this wasn't my first domestic disturbance call, but I also knew there shouldn't be anyone in that apartment to even have a disturbance. I took a deep breath and pounded on the door. Police! I don't have an explanation for what happened next, so I'll just report it. The landing got cold. Not, there was a breeze, cold, but frigid. So cold I could see my breath puffing out, fast and uneven. The landing light came on, even though I wasn't anywhere near the switch, and that somehow made the shadows at the edges of the landing even darker. At that point, all I wanted was to leave, but I couldn't make myself move. I have no idea what I would have done if I hadn't heard a whimper. I almost jumped out of my skin when something touched my leg. It was Mrs. Belinsky's little white poodle, shivering so hard it looked like it was going to shake itself into pieces. I don't know what it was about the dog, but just having it there, knowing I needed to get it back to Mrs. B, who loved it, made me able to move. I scooped up the dog and started hustling down the stairs. I was terrified that it would take just as long to get down them as it had seemed to take to go up, but I felt like I was able to move normally. I didn't breathe right until I got down to Mrs. Belinsky's floor. 
As soon as the poodle saw her, it squirmed out of my hold and trotted over to the elderly lady who was sitting with a couple of the neighbors. That cold feeling I'd had vanished, and I was left feeling almost silly for being so worried. I don't quite remember how I ended up filling out the incident report on that call, but I'm pretty sure I didn't mention cold spots, odd time distortions, and an argument from people who didn't exist. As for Mrs. Belinsky's little noise problem, well, her neighbors talked her into having her parish priest over, and I guess blessing the house did the trick. Or at least I was never called back there for that kind of disturbance again. There is a state park in Illinois that has a whole slew of hidden canyons, caves, and waterfalls. It's a strange place. You wouldn't think to find anything like it in the area, judging by the surrounding deciduous forests and flat, open fields. The park isn't terribly large either, but it is highly trafficked in the summer months. There is a campground and several cabins in the park that are usually rented out many months in advance. This is where I worked as a park ranger for six years. There is a long, tragic history of this park, starting with two warring Native American tribes that lived in the area. I won't get into all of that here, but there have been strange happenings in the park since the very start. A lot of people blame it on native ghosts who died on the land, and while there may indeed be ghosts here, there is something else here as well. We would get reports from guests about animals damaging their property in the campgrounds and other strange things, like tents being unzipped in the middle of the night and things moving around. There was one instance where rocks from a fire pit were placed in a circle around the tent of the guest staying there. Even more confounding was the fact that the had but out there fire late in the evening, so the rocks were undoubtedly extremely hot. The complaints we would get from the cabin guests were that something was knocking on the doors, scraping on the walls and tapping on the window glass. It was all weird but mostly harmless stuff at least harmless in that no one was physically injured. If someone left anything outside unsecured, though, it could likely be moved. But then it gets weird. First, I should explain to you a little about the layout of the park. There are several canyons. Most of them are box canyons with no way out. You have to hike in and then turn around and hike out. Most of these canyons have waterfalls of some sort. Depending on the season, the waterfalls can range from a steady supply of water to just a trickle. There are usually stagnant pools of water at the base of the canyons. The waters there are a beautiful bluish green. Gorgeous in photos, but I definitely wouldn't go swimming in them. A few times a year we would get reports of hikers seeing creatures in these bluish green pools or hearing a voice telling them to go in. Often. They would report that it was the voice of someone they knew, but the person wasn't there. It was super weird stuff. There wasn't a whole lot we could tell them, other than not to go into the pools and keep themselves alert. Like I said, it only happened a few times a year, but it did happen year after year. Most of the reports were from the same three locations in the park. One particular summer, it was extremely hot and we didn't have much rainfall. The pools were shrinking, but we were getting higher than normal reports from hikers. None of the reports were incredibly detailed. I think it was because people didn't want us to think they were crazy. Most of the time, they would just say they saw something strange in the canyon or on the trail or hear something strange, and let us know that we should probably check it out. After the fifth report that summer, I started doing some digging. I pulled up all the reports for the last 10 years and marked their location on a map. I don't know why no one had dug into this before, but I found that the locations were all relatively close to caves. That was the only thing they had in common. There is a pretty extensive cave system throughout the canyons, but I'm not sure if it has been explored in detail, or at least it hasn't been mapped out recently. Judging from the map, there was a possibility that the caves could be interconnected, but I wasn't certain. There was one canyon, however, that seemed to have the most action, and right next to it were three large caves. So one day I made an excuse about needing to head to that area so I could test my theory. I parked my vehicle at the trailhead and hiked in about six miles to the first canyon. There were what looked like fish bones along the edge of the pool at the end of the canyon. 
Now this was rather strange. I didn't think fish would be able to survive in an environment like that. But at least I didn't see any creatures, nor did I hear any strange voices. I set out on my mission to explore inside the caves. I brought a handheld flashlight and a headlamp and a rope to tie to a tree outside the cave so that I wouldn't get lost if the cave had multiple chambers. I headed into the largest cave first. I didn't find anything strange at the entrance, but quickly I realized I had made a huge mistake. I followed the cave for what felt like an eternity, although I'm sure it was only a few minutes. I heard something move in the distance, and I shined my light on it. I couldn't see what it was, but it looked like there was a nest of some sort in the cave. It looked like a bird's nest, but it was so large it could have fit a human. It was lined with fresh leaves and grass. There were bones scattered around the outside of the nest. There were no animals I knew of that made any nests like that. I pulled on the rope to help me find my way back out to find that it was slack. I tried to pull the slack out and it was never ending. I realized then that my rope had been either cut or untied. All of a sudden the air felt thin and it was hard to breathe. I did my best not to panic. I hurried out of the cave as quickly as I could and by some miracle made it outside. I took a quick look around but I didn't see anything. Yet something out here had released my rope. Sure enough, when I got to the tree where I had tied it, there was nothing there, but something had obviously untied it. I knew I needed to leave. I didn't know what was out there, but I just knew I had to get far away, fast. I turned back to give it all one last look and that's when I saw it, although only for a moment. It was crouched down near the entrance of the cave, just beyond the light. It looked ghostly. I don't know how else to describe it. It was like a human, but it wasn't a human. It had no hair on its body and was so pale it was nearly pure white, like something that had never seen the sunlight. Its eyes were huge for the size of its head, and I didn't see much of a nose. I ran nearly the entire six miles back to the truck, and I never went into that place alone again.